Why are you in politics? I, You're not in politics. Why I'm do you, not why in do you, politics. Why do you talk about politics? Well, I'm interested in social reform. Is that why you do content, social media related stuff? Is it to further social issues? Or is that just because you're glued to social media? No, I think it is more personal to me. Mm. I think يعني, ultimately, I really don't understand uh, if I want to be or not want to be. I really don't understand any economy. I just want <laughs> some version of a uh, uh, liberal uh, society with social justice where Anjad, this country um, is a hub of creativity, where art really flourishes, where it's a country of minds and talents and, uh, and music and dance and nightclubs. And that's the kind of identity. Uh, I ideally, I think you no know, Lebanese society could morph into. That is Lebanese society on a better day. Yeah. In your limited time on this planet, yeah, you've seen the country kind of go on a roller coaster, but mostly yeah. towards an abyss. Uh, is that something that you work for in your content creation? I mean, what? I don't. How do you translate these desires into politics? I think. Well, I think the foundation of any uh, liberal society is the ability of people to listen and accept other people's differences, and that happens when we normalize our differences first mm. and learn to talk about them without feeling threatened. Mm. So the more dialogue. And the more normalization we have to, to all of these social issues, I think at, if, if we are able to sit and talk about any social issue in Lebanon and all of the, uh, all of the uh, distance that we still have to cross in order to attain a, a more equal society, I think that is a sign and we're moving in the right direction. The moment we start to move away from talking and censor each other and Jmud al are parading and Ashrafiyya parading, not for, you know, pun intended, <laughs> uh, banning uh, conversations or uh, uh, events to raise awareness on people's uh, sexual diversity in Ashrafiyya. It's the, like the quintessential uh, uh, cultural neighborhood of Beirut. That is a very dangerous sign to me. When you speak about not... When, when you refer to a minority within minorities mm. and you said social mm. social justice mm. are you projecting here that political reform leads get, to leads to social uh, reform yeah yeah so political reform comes first they meet halfway mm. because politicians need to realize that there is a demand for uh, so for social justice uh, based discourse mm. Because politicians, they don't go against the norms. The norms are created culturally. Mm. Politicians work within what is called the, Over the Overton window, which is the window that, that dictates uh, uh, what is seen by society as attainable and possible. So if today Lebanese society, for example, finds it unattainable and impossible to apply civil marriage, most politicians will not go against this norm. Even if on a personal basis they believe in it, they will mm. not want to upset the general voters. So cultural change comes from, which is why, well, I was recently watching a series on Netflix, Ismo Hollywood. It's about the first time Hollywood produced a movie with a black female lead actress. And it oh. was in the 1920s. Wow. And during the movie, there's a scene, spoiler alert, there's a scene where uh, the wife of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, she walks into the studio that is leading this challenge and she tells them, Change doesn't happen from Washington. It happens from Hollywood. We tried to do this and we failed. It's your job. So the, this cultural awakening and uprising comes from 
uh, art, influencers, entertainment, uh, underground politics, alternative media. These are those are the the things that pave the way, and then politicians can walk behind them and implement these rules. I've heard this said these before. Laws. I don't know if getting it right that politics is downstream from culture. Yeah. 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 But I've heard that said from people that I would not want in politics. They mm. tend to be the more radical mm. and the more uh, system destructive yeah. type. Yeah. Are you in that world too? Are you trying to overthrow something? No, I don't believe. No, uh, I don't. I think if we look at what's going on in in the U.S., for example, where polarization has reached a point could be described as cultural civil war. Mm. It's because one part won by force, rather than getting everybody on board with their ideas, they can feel يعني one part defeated the other and implemented their changes. And then when the other part gained back traction, they're now trying to reverse course. So if any mm. kind of change comes in spite of other people, it will, it will it's only a matter of time before the other people gain back power and push back these changes. With all due respect, I think this cultural war has gone insane because of content creation. I think well, the alternative media landscape has driven us insane. I think it's, I think it's because all of these activists did not realize <laughs> that at some point you reached the peak of your cause and you need to stop inventing issues mm. that, that we don't have. <laughs> yani, I'm going to say this. Gender ideology was never part of uh, the the fight for gay rights. It became a part when one party that felt you know, they had a monopoly and on the on this demographic ran out of new ideas to sell. So they're like, oh no, you have more rights that you don't know of that we need to go and get. So I believe and no. I wouldn't expect anyone in your age group to say this. Yeah. But it's a reality, and it's unpopular, and I will get cancelled. No, actually, I, I mm, no, that's that's not going to get you cancelled. Yeah. But it's uh, it's it's not in line. It's not in line. Yeah, yeah. because Lanoja, and no, we don't realize. Oh, this comes down to identity politics, anyway. Mm. Because then there are politicians that realize, and no, they can take advantage of your insecure of your social insecurity. Uh, to keep you locked in a in a two-party system. They're either with you or they're against you. It's the us versus them rhetoric. So the other part, the other side, is, is a threat to your lifestyle, to your rights, uh, to your values, and this is a two-way street. So when you say... I'm uh, we have not reached this point, Lebanon. So what exactly are the social causes you're talking about? No. And I think and the content creation is what pushed us over polarization. It's I, because yeah. content creation was weaponized no longer to achieve a hey, progress, right. but to hijack identity politics. So, so, hey, the horn, well, how does that... Oh, no, we're 100 years away from that. Behind? Yeah. Okay, so what, what are you fighting for here? Just basic basic common sense and decency. That's, that's the simplest thing. It's not, it's no longer acceptable in Lebanon and a government can censor a movie. No, no, can, no, no, we used to export art to the world. <laughs> That's true. Now we get uh, movies and books censored. It's no longer acceptable in Lebanon. And no, uh, uh, and no, if a woman gets sexually assaulted, she's ashamed of uh, submitting a shakwa and the baladi and the or whatever. يعني نحن ما فينا. We've always had this. We've always, as Lebanese, had the sense that no, نحن we are the most liberal Arab nation. And uh, our laws don't reflect that at all. And uh, and we used to think that we are a liberal people, but then I discovered that no, it's a bubble. We, I live in a liberal bubble. <laughs> and, no, Lebanon is not uh, Hamra and Manam Khayel and Jamaize and... Uh, Common sense, decency, what does that mean to you? Anta, you said you're a minority within a minority. Yeah. Are you talking about your age group? No, I'm talking about... And, no, and I don't subscribe to a certain religion. Let's start there. Or, or a religious belief system. Mm. And I don't subscribe and no uh, morality is tied to religion necessarily. 
Uh, and this I is think why you brought up these groups. Okay, so it's really yeah. about trying to make secularism real, like socially you, acceptable, socially acceptable, but not in the way we use it. It's more like in a lifestyle, cultural way. Yeah, although enough of it is available, but you want it to be more. Yes. Yeah. And I don't want that change to come in spite of the people who don't want to live in a secular state. Yani if you are a religious guy, you believe in you know, religious value in, in your belief system, mm. I don't want to attack religion. So you see, this, this is the issue. Social, yeah. reform Social reform is religious. And I think really. if we have, I, I think had Lebanon been a country of liberal democratic values, any militia like Hezbollah would not survive a day because it feeds on a uh, on a, uh, f- a fanatic slash uh, fundamentalist base. You think Hezbollah has to do with that? I thought Hezbollah was a uh, paramilitary force, not one of religious persuasion. To me, I always get into this issue of the religi- religiosity of yeah. Hezbollah. Yeah. To me, it's secondary. Just like the regime in Iran, I never really cared for their, mm-hmm. even though it's part of it, I don't think theocracy is what the regime really is at the end of the day. It's mm. a military dictatorship. Mm. And I see Hezbollah as a paramilitary force. Mm. That it's theocratic is not as important. Mm. But that's kind of coming at it from a very, like, uh, only using the violent stuff, mm. less to do with how, how it works mm. in persuasion. Mm. But do you think social reform could fix something as big as Hezbollah? No, it could have prevented it had it been there. But mm. you, know, you, cannot, you cannot use social reform to, mm. to dismantle Hezbollah's base. Yeah. But had Lebanon been a nation, a society that rejects fundamentalism to start with, then there would not have been the grounds, or at least to grow as much as, uh, mm. as it did. Mm. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people whether whether Hezbollah relies on its really on on its religion you know, religiosity or not, there are hundreds of thousands of people that back it and its religiosity. So, you the, think Hezbollah, a secular Hezbollah, would be less persuasive? No, I think uh, a, a, uh, uh, a a religious Hezbollah would not have gained traction in a secular society or a liberal society. Mm. Even when secular militias did gain traction in a sectarian society? Yes, because it was a different context. I might be wrong. That's interesting. I've never, I've never mm. really thought of it this I way. might be wrong, because yeah. this, this requires a case study to be able to really determine. But I'm saying, let's put Hezbollah on mm. Hezbollah is too big of a problem to be, to be an, uh, attached to a smaller problem. But I believe, you know, as long as this is uh, a socially uh, reformed liberal state, I really don't care uh, any uh, uh, any uh, uh, government uh, style you want, decentralized or federalized or central. I really don't care as long as everybody gets to live the way they want, and everybody's needs are met and well administered. Mm. Hello, there's a certain line that you cannot blur between. Uh, Economy and social justice, because mm. a lot of parts of, you know, a big part of uh, human rights were the economical rights. Yeah. Uh, so I understand. Had I Bukra in the comment section, and Umbala George, you have to care about the political system if you care about social justice, because yeah. you know there's a direct correlation. Okay, fine. I just don't want, uh, don't want anybody to live in this country and feel, you know, their existence is threatened. Yeah. Or their ideas are, you know, their way of life is threatened. When we reach this. I think it's peak point for me. So it's really about fairness for an individual like you. Yes. But you're not the only one. No, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not. Yeah. That's a, that's a very soft-spoken, measured way of talking about something I don't really talk about much, which is the, the most... These are the groups that... The individuals that don't fit in mm. naturally. mm but it's because the these, outcasts. The, uh, but not because you can't. You can. Mm. It's just that the groups that, that are easiest to identify with don't reflect you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is something that could be reformed as well, mm. if political reform, in all of its, uh, in all of its outdated, 
you know, everything that you're talking about should have been taken care of the last 50 years. Yeah, because we are 50 years behind. Yeah. 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 Imagine what 50 years could have done had there not been this level of instability and war and regional problems in this country. 50 years is the same period where somebody like Alan Turing in the UK was committed suicide. He was the, do you know his story? No. He's the father of um, uh, computer sciences. Okay. And he's yeah. the man that uh, broke the uh, enigma of the uh, of the Nazi uh, communication. Uh, oh, yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, even despite the fact that he single-handedly won the war against the Nazis, his invention, the, he had to kill himself four years later because it was illegal in the UK back then uh, to be a homosexual. So they threatened him between castration or prison, and he ended up killing himself. Fifty years later, the queen is legalizing gay marriage in the UK. That's how much you can cross in 50 years. You're comfortable defending uh, a certain, let's say, disenfranchised way mm. of uh, certain... It includes a lot of the Lebanese that simply want to be left alone as individuals mm. and want to be treated like communities are treated mm. meaning there's expression for both yeah yeah you're you're 31 i'm 29 29 yeah so we're 12 years apart yeah um okay well you're turning 30 yeah uh in your adult years yeah do you see this as your mission here since you've flirted with politics quite a bit is that why you're i can't separate it from politics which is why it's very important to me and even as we lead the fight against our enemy now, not to to make sure that we're not creating future enemies, because I don't care who's oppressing me. If you're if you're if you're an oppressor, I don't care where you got your money or funds or or uh, or uh, missiles from. <laughs> I don't care if you have to use missiles or not. If you are a threat to my way of life. I don't care who you are. I, I identify you as, as an equal enemy, as an mm. equal threat. Yeah. So that's why I don't want to create another uh, uh, a counter Nasrallah to fight Nasrallah. And that maybe now you have a window into why I am very cautious about who I think we can trust on the long term and who I don't think we can trust on the mm. long term. Because hey, we should fight this battle but you know, if it leads me to, to, create, to create another monster in the process, I don't want to keep fighting. Oh, I share that sentiment fully. Yeah. You remind me of me, mm. younger, mm. a little more uh, focused on that social aspect. Yeah. And then sort of getting stuck in... And here's where I have a set of questions for oh, you. Sure. <laughs> so you were saying... <clears throat> Abla Shwa, I know, used to be very like oriented on social issues. Yes. And then slowly, somehow, you you just drifted into like talking exclusively about a single issue. Um, Not exclusively. She, yeah. I mean, it became. It actually. I shouldn't interrupt you. It. I did not want this to become part of my life, and then became part of my life. I was going to ask this. Oh, she. When was your political awakening? Nineteen ninety-eight, mm. when Ferris Boyes was calling the embassy mm. in America, yelling, "Bissafara!" And you overheard this conversation. I overheard many conversations. Heck, your father was the Lebanese ambassador to the U.S., and mm -hmm. you were living in the embassy. Yeah, I did. And not, how old were you? Uh, then, sixteen, seventeen. Okay. I didn't want to hear them, mm. but I knew that he was upset, and I kind of heard these things and mm. I saw it happening. Walid mm. Ma'allim, a uh, serious foreign minister, met him in a few years. Mm. Can Safir Surya be America? Mm. He would come over. Mm. It was very unpleasant uh, visits. Hasset mm. fishi But uh, that not maybe that's not the awakening, that's like eyes opening shway. Yeah. Fishi Yeah. Maybe it's two thousand five when the March 14 protests 
quickly turned into murders. Mm-hmm. These repetitive murders that were happening. I was in Lebanon. I was actually very close to Sessin uh, when Atal Samir Asir. Yeah. That I think uh, came in. It made me uh, mm. become more more proud of that protest. So, like, just taking a step backwards, because okay, you gave me a window into this uh, hard question. How did Tammuz come in? And I can be Zico House. Yeah. My Fadi is Musamidun, communist collective. <laughs> we went around distributing hygiene kits yeah. to the refugees displaced. Be al Madaris, Beirut. Came in. It felt like this whole war is unnecessary. Mm. This whole thing shouldn't have happened. Yet we're in the middle of a of a horrible event. It shouldn't even be happening. Mm. Come in. That I think all of these moments and many more in between made me rethink why is this country perpetually screwed up? Mm. Go ahead. Uh if you have a much deeper uh, <laughs> deeper motive than I, than I do. So because it's a hard, I don't know if it, this could be a hard question. You don't have to like go into it, but you gave me a window. You know, how was it like to grow up with Muhammad Shatah as your father? Uh, what do you mean? In what way? Um, well, in what way do you feel it impacted you most? أنا ما شفتو كحدا غير friend. Hmm. Never uh, thought of him as more than a friend. Mm. Even uh, even in moments that clearly he's more than a friend, uh, I never thought of him as anything else. The status that became uh, now is a different name to me. Mm. When he was alive, it was really just soulmate, mm. best friend. But uh, no, I... Never had this. Hadan b'siyasi, or hadan mustashar, or hadan kain wazir. Nine months, wala safir, wala. Now it's like seditious to say it's horrible. Naib hakim masaf Lebanon. There's a little time yeah. in the early early nineties, early mid nineties. Uh, none of these positions. IMF, his career in America. It was just uh, this guy gets me and I get him. Mm. And yeah, and, uh, do you feel like you have an obligation to carry on doing politics today? You wrote these questions before you came here. Yeah. Um, Let me add something to the question. Because of unfinished, unjust. Uh, story do you feel like you have an obligation to continue doing politics yeah can you picture your life differently or had you not been uh, first you know, somebody to first hand experience a loss due to political violence do you think you would have been still been down this line today one way or another would, would politics have drawn you in or could you have seen yourself doing something different I don't think I'm in politics. Mm. I think I'm keeping unique voices that I deeply respected alive. Mm. That it transcends into politics is completely unique to what they believed in. Mm. I don't think of my father as a politician, mm. even though technically that is how his career is defined. Mm. But I think what he wanted the kind of country he imagined is the kind of country you referred mm. to earlier. And I was thinking when you were talking, it kind of reminded me of this freer, more more, more relaxed, mm. but also proud country mm. that it gets tangled up in geopolitics and it gets, it ends in a car bombing and it really like 
so much time is wasted on trying to manage that. I don't think I don't think of him as a politician. I don't think of Samir Asir as a politician either. Mm. I think they're just uh, there's a set of principles that these people believed in. I have no problem honoring them and expanding. Mm. But uh, I think I would be exactly in the same place, uh, except he would be alive. Mm. And that would make a huge difference because the other thing that I do, which I think I've learned to take a step back from, there was a time where I didn't touch it, actually. There were four years. Four years. I didn't say the word Hasballah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I didn't hear my father's voice for four years. I didn't open anything. I didn't look at anything. I was, I was paralyzed for four years. Mm. It took me four years to even come back to this country. So I, I, mm. I took off. Uh, it's making sure the group that killed him, uh, if they're getting away with it, they have a thorn in their side on the way. Mm. That's the most I can do. Yeah. Thank you for, because I know this, you know, I can tell from your tone of voice how serious this is for you. And I can see. And this is, you know, I feel like uh, we're all just uh, fighting to create fairness. Fairness for you is justice. Fairness for me is acceptance. And, and this is why I think we are so uh, principled in what we want. And uh, yeah. I think it, I think we're both wanting to do the same thing. Each you know, each person is carrying the burden of a uh, painful uh, truth or reality, and uh, trying to go from here. I learned from my first episode. That's the reason I kept doing the podcast. The first episode was fantastic. Mm. It was with Ziad Dwayri. He talked about his movies and his reasons for doing certain movies and going into contentious topics is because he thought this country lacked fairness. Mm. And maybe that form of art, that way of storytelling, is a form of poetic justice that yeah. explains that. Mm. And lack of fairness, I think, is central to the message. Mm. So. And it's the root of all evil. Yeah. But... Uh, never really thought about there's I'll ask the earlier question better uh, I know that he would not have retired in a different he would still be doing what he was doing probably in far more difficult circumstances and maybe actually certainly he would have moved on from his post that he inherited back then uh but uh, I think he would have still been thinking and trying. So if I'm able to do a part of that on the way, and it gets uh, interesting, you, you meet interesting people in this country that suddenly they become part of your life, and then you're attending political events. If that's politics, then mm. that's fine. And that's the end. And that's the end. Of the cameras. <laughs> we did it. We did it. Jeez. Two in the morning. George, boom!